really good. is fitting when we come to this conference, the continuing quest for the historical Jesus, Jesus of Nazareth, his teachings, his wisdom, his life, his work. And here we are gathered to remember, commemorate the great contributions to scholarship of Professor David Flusser, Dr. Robert Lindsay, Professor Shmuel Safra'i, and it is such an honor for me as a former student to be able to come and share with you. And uh, we're going to be looking at a very serious issue in biblical studies, New Testament research. Why is rabbinic literature pertinent to New Testament studies? Today there are probably a lot of people who would argue that rabbinic literature really is not relevant. And they have you know, several reasons that they uh, use on different occasions. One that I often hear is really that they just don't want Jesus to be too Jewish. Uh, it's all right for him to be, you know, from Palestine and to have been born in Bethlehem, but they would really rather him be more of a Catholic Jew or a Baptist Jew, and it's hard for them to really uh, compare Jesus with uh, the Jewish people at that time. Another reason... They do not want Jesus to be a rabbi teacher or an interpreter of Torah. Uh, yesterday, as we were studying uh, this theme of the Baalzebub controversy, I couldn't help but note this statement that was made by a very famous biblical scholar, Martin Hingle, when he declared, quite certainly, Jesus was not a teacher comparable with the later rabbinic experts in the law. Now this is really a tendency within a lot of writings in the New Testament. I think one of the uh, third reason, I'm just going to talk about three reasons uh, here in my opening remarks, uh, is that often they claim that the rabbinic literature is too late. It's written at a later time and therefore is not relevant for New Testament studies. I'm going to be talking about this today, the dating of rabbinic literature and some of the reasons why I believe that rabbinic literature can be very beneficial in our study of the historical Jesus and our examination of early Christianity and really throughout the New Testament. I can only say here briefly that I think there's a lot of inconsistencies here in New Testament studies. I don't know, I had to smile last night as uh, Halveronin or Yochanan Ronen, his uh, Hebrew name, uh, made the comment that scholars are very quick to study the Gospel of Thomas and now you know we have the National Geographical Society spending enormous amount of money to obtain, translate and publish this Gospel of Judas, documents written in Coptic from Egypt, and I thought his comment was kind of interesting. We've got the doubter and the traitor gospel, and we're going to use those, um, all, both of which would have been written you know, closer to the time of some of the rabbinic literature and probably much later than some of the rabbinic texts that we'll be studying today. And this is kind of a debate that rages in New Testament scholarship. We have uh, some very leading prominent scholars, say like E.P. Sanders or James Charlesworth, that are using uh, the rabbinic literature. We have other uh, scholars that criticize this. There's kind of a group that say, well, the only uh, text, the only date that we can give to the text is the actual time that it was written, and we can't think of it preserving any earlier material. What we cannot show, we cannot know is sometimes used. In other words, if I can't prove you the copyright date of when something is written and connect it before 30, well, obviously it can't be used to study Jesus. You know, even with these three reasons, I think that probably one of the uh, major reasons that this is a question for a lot of people is this reluctance to acknowledge and embrace the family heritage of Jesus and to recognize the historical background where Jesus is among his people. Uh, if I could put it this way, 
I think sometimes they really want to close off all of the rabbis and their teachings into a ghetto so that they won't be a nuisance. And they say, entrance is forbidden. And today, what I want to say is that we need to get the rabbis and their teachings out of the ghetto. And we need to let them stream into all of New Testament research. We need to understand what the rabbis taught about prayer, what they taught about grace, what they taught about love. Already with Hanan Eshel's excellent presentation, we have seen some of the close connections between the Dead Sea Scrolls and uh, the teachings of Jesus. And today, as a foundation for our study, I'd like to read this uh, well-known passage called the Beatitudes within the Sermon on the Mount from Matthew 5, verses 3 through 12. I'm going to be reading from our uh, new translation, the Hebrew Heritage Translation. And as I explained in my previous lecture, while there are you know, several different approaches to translation from the uh, literal equivalency where you have a word-for-word -word representation. You can only translate one word one way in every context, which sometimes makes uh, the text completely impossible to understand and can be very misleading to the other extreme where people want to have a dynamic translation and just uh, almost paraphrase the Bible to I think what most translations aim for today is kind of a, a formal uh, equivalency, a functional equivalency. And so what we are arguing for for our translation is what a Hebrew literal functional equivalency because instead of ignoring completely the Hebrew language, we are really focusing on what did that Greek text mean in Hebrew? How would first century Jewish people understand it? And I don't think you can always translate every word in Hebrew or every word in Greek with just one word. So today we're going to read from uh, Matthew chapter 5. And I would invite you to follow along uh, in your translation. You may want to do some comparison with this. And as we go into our issue today, studying why rabbinic literature is so very pertinent to New Testament studies, we're going to consider some of these teachings of our Lord and others in the New Testament. Uh, when Yeshua saw the crowds of people, he went up on the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples gathered around him. He opened his mouth and started to teach them, saying, Oh, what great blessing God shows to the poor who know their need for the Spirit, because it is they who make up the kingdom of heaven. Oh, what great blessing God shows to those who grieve, because it is they who are comforted. Oh, what great blessing God shows to those who are kind-hearted, because it is they who inherit the earth. Oh, what great blessing God shows to those who hunger and thirst for righteousness because it is they who are satisfied. Oh, what great blessing God shows to those who give mercy because it is they who receive mercy from God. Oh, what great blessing God shows to those who are pure in heart because it is they who see God. Oh, what great blessing God shows to those who make peace, because it is they who are called children of God. Oh, what great blessing God shows to those who pursue the cause of righteousness, because it is they who make up the kingdom of heaven. Oh, what great blessing God shows to you when people insult you, persecute you, and speak all sorts of evil accusations against you falsely because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because your reward in heaven is immense. After all, in the same way, they persecuted the prophets who came before you. Let's direct our hearts to the Lord. Our gracious Father, we do thank you for this time that we have to study. I pray, Lord, that your Spirit would guide and direct and teach us and give us fresh insights into your Word as we study the relevance of rabbinic literature 
for New Testament research. In thy precious name we pray. Amen. There's a very famous New Testament scholar. I could mention his name, and he would begin his lectures at the university by saying, the first thing you must do to be a good Christian is to kill the Jew that's inside of you. One of his students raised her hand and said, Professor, do you mean Jesus? <laughs> well, I think she possessed the greater wisdom. If we're going to understand Jesus' teachings on the Sermon on the Mount, or if we're going to understand other texts of the New Testament, somehow we have to recover this historical background. And of course, if we look at the historical background, there's a great difference between the Christian view or Western view of history and let's say uh, our view of history. Usually we look, put our history on a linear approach, a line, and we have this timeline of certain events, usually focusing on political developments, who ruled at what time, when what army came, conquered this area. And, you know, that's kind of the way we look at history through politicians, political events. What I like to stress when we start looking at uh, history, say, from a Jewish perspective, is that it's very Torah-centric. You really see that all events are clustered around the revelation of Torah. And actually, this is probably one of the fundamental differences between Judaism and Christianity today. It's the way we view history. Most of us look at the Torah as being one document that was given to Moses on Mount Sinai. Uh, maybe the Ten Commandments, maybe the five books of Moses, different views traditionally. When we talk about traditional uh, Christian views of the Torah, I'm not talking about the higher critical schools. And we think that this happened at that time. What I'd like to stress is that when we start looking at this from the Jewish standpoint of history is that Moses did not receive just one Torah. He received both a written Torah and an oral Torah that explained it. Of course, I know probably even in a group like this, we have some of those King James only people. You know, I think they believe that the King James Version was given to Moses on Mount Sinai and only later was translated into Greek and Hebrew. Uh, but if we're going to look at this as the Jewish approach, uh, listen to what the opening verse of Pirkei Avot says. And this is a document from the Mishnah, a document that's republished in the Jewish prayer book. And it talks about this understanding of history. Moses received the Torah on Mount Sinai and delivered it over to Joshua. Joshua delivered it over to the elders, the elders to the prophets. The prophets delivered it to the men of the great gathering together. They said three things. Be deliberate in judgment. Raise up many disciples and make a fence around the Torah. Now when this document says that Moses received Torah on Mount Sinai, that doesn't mean that he just received the Ten Commandments or the five books of Moses. According to the Jewish understanding of this historical background, he received not only the written law, but also an oral commentary that would explain and interpret that law. I think it's very fitting that we would start this uh, lecture today by reading the Beatitudes because it talks about the qualities of discipleship. It's interesting in a commentary on this text in another rabbinic source called Vot uh, the Rabbi Natan, the sayings according to the fathers of Rabbi Nathan, uh, it quotes the house of Hillel, Hillel who lived 20 BCE. The house of Hillel says, one should teach all people for there were many rebellious ones in Israel, yet they were drawn to the study of Torah, and from them emerged pious and upright people. So you see, the object of study is really for a change of character, to be one of the poor in spirit, one of those who grieve when they see 
the sinful world around them, suffering people, lost humanity, in need of redemption, in need of a greater relationship with God, those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, those who are merciful. These are qualities of discipleship. It's kind of interesting, Solomon Schechter, a great rabbi of uh, who taught at Jewish Theological Seminary, made the statement, the occupation with Torah was, according to the rabbis, less calculated to produce schoolmen and jurists than saints and devout spirits. So you see, the object of Torah learning was not only to attain academic understanding, which is, of course is important in this literature and this approach, but the primary object was to come closer to God. I like the way that Abraham Joshua Heschel asked the question about the difference between the Western approach to education and the Jewish approach to education. In Western society, we approach education to attain knowledge, to comprehend the universe. But he said the object of Jewish education in Hebrew thought is Da'at Elohim, the knowledge of God. It is Yir'at Adonai, the fear of God. And really, the aim of education in this literature is to come to a sense of awe, respect of God himself. Some people say, well, why do you need a written law? Well, you need it really because you have an oral law. You need a written law, you need an oral law in order to understand the written law. Uh, well, not only do we have to get the right perspective on the historical background and the Jewish view of history, but we also have to get in clear focus the Jewishness of Jesus. I like the way that biblical scholar Anthony Soldarini asked the question, what is the uniqueness of Jesus? Does Jesus the Jew, as a Jew, have any impact on Christian theology and Jewish-Christian relations? Now sometimes I think that Jesus has very little impact on churchianity. And if we really want a renewal within Christianity, we need to start with Jesus of history. If we're going to know Jesus of history, we have to begin with the Judaism of Jesus, which is often revealed through a careful analysis of rabbinic literature. Soldarini goes on to say, to wrench Jesus out of his Jewish world destroys Jesus and destroys Christianity the religion that grew out of his teachings. Even Jesus' most familiar role as Christ is a Jewish role. If Christians leave the concrete realities of Jesus' life and of the history of Israel in favor of a mythic, universal, spiritual Jesus and another worldly kingdom of God, they deny their origins in Israel, their history, and the God who loved and protected Israel and the church they cease to interpret the actual Jesus sent by God and remake him in their own image and likeness. The dangers are obvious. If Christians violently wrench Jesus out of his natural, ethnic, and historical place within the people of Israel, they open the way to doing equal violence to Israel, the place, and the people of Jesus. And I think we can even see in the history of this century, especially the Holocaust, the disastrous results of a church that has broken itself, severed itself entirely from the Hebrew heritage and the Jewish roots of Jesus. Jesus was a Jew, and he was intimately connected to his people. I think this is important when we start looking at the cultural experience of our Lord, because uh, there is a cultural connection with his family. I think this is important even when we think about the languages and the different language situation today. I know that today it's uh, widely taught that our Gospels were originally written in Aramaic. Again, I think that this is one of the ways that scholars have tried to make Jesus less a Jewish Jew connected to his land and his people and try to see him more as an international Jew. It's all right for Jesus to be a Jewish cynic. It's all right for him to be a Jewish stoic. It's all right for him to be a zealot. But it's very difficult to see him as a teacher, someone who's devoted to Torah. 
Now, I would argue that Jesus' mother language was Hebrew, and he spoke Hebrew at home. I think after the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls, many scholars are willing to at least entertain the idea that since so much of the religious literature from these documents that are indisputably coming from the dating of the period almost entirely in Hebrew, probably 95, 98% all written in Hebrew, uh, that certainly there were religious documents written in Hebrew. I think we ought to rethink what we say about the Apostle Paul. I wrote this in the sequel to my book, Jesus the Jewish Theologian, which is called Paul the Jewish Theologian. Somebody says, boy, you can just keep on going, Peter, John. Uh, well, right now that's the end of the Jewish Theologian series. But, you know, one thing, it's, uh, it's not so dangerous to say Jesus is a Jewish theologian, but people really get upset when you talk about Paul being a Jewish theologian, or that Paul was a loyal Pharisee. But how does Paul describe himself? A Hebrew of the Hebrews. How can you say that that's not language? He's defining his language and his background. Oh no, but he was born in Tarsus. Well, listen to what he says in the book of Acts. I was born in Tarsus, but I grew up in Jerusalem. I studied at the feet of Gamaliel. I mean, you know, it doesn't mean that he didn't know Greek. I think probably Jesus would have known Hebrew, Greek, Aramaic. Probably Paul knew Hebrew, Greek, and Aramaic. But what language did they pray in? What language did they study the Bible in? What language did he teach the Bible in? And if you're a Jewish person at home, what language did you speak? I believe in this period especially, it was, it was Hebrew. Only later in the rabbinic literature, after the time of the Tanaim, in the 3rd century A.D., 3rd century uh, C.E., do we find that Aramaic begins to replace Hebrew in the rabbinic literature. Now, I think the real question that we should be asking here is whether it was a kind of um, biblical Hebrew or more of a Mishnaic Hebrew. And I think what we should be focusing our energy on is more the type of Hebrew that Jesus spoke rather than whether he spoke Hebrew or, or not. Also, in this context, we have to think about how important the temple was to uh, the Jesus and the early disciples. One of the things I think we should keep in mind is that when Jesus taught the Beatitudes and when he looked at the temple and he looked at the surrounding area, what was he focused on? Righteousness, justice, love for one another. How do you really love God with all your heart? How do you demonstrate that in the way that you love one another? Uh, I don't know, today we have so much interest in the temple, and of course, uh, as an archaeologist, not professionally, I've been involved in some digs, but you know, as someone who's very intently interested in studying the results of archaeology and digs here, and uh, all of the historical background I can from the Second Temple period. I really am interested in the temple, everything that happened in the temple. But I think sometimes we forget that at this time, both the Pharisees and Jesus, many of the leaders felt like that the temple priesthood represented by the Sadducees was quite corrupt, and there needed to be a spiritual revitalization of the nation. Think about how Jesus flows in this tradition of Amos from the Hebrew prophets. He would criticize the priesthood. Amos said, take away from me, God speaking, take away from me the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the sound of your harps, but let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. Oh, how powerful that is in Hebrew. You know, you can't get any stronger stream than a nachal eitan. I mean, that is like the strongest, most powerful stream. And I don't know, I've been out here in the desert before. I mean, you wouldn't think of it in the Dead Sea, but driving my little Volkswagen with rain in Jerusalem, there's not a drop of rain falling in the Dead Sea. And I can't drive my car because of the flood on the highways. And I have to wait till... Uh, the water passes through. Well, there's a powerful stream, and he wanted to use that as a metaphor to describe righteousness. I think when Jesus said, see what 
great blessing God shows to those that hunger and thirst after righteousness. He was calling for righteousness rather than just all of the singing that we talk about. So Jesus is very much connected to this when he talks about the temple experience. We have to also, in this context, talk about the Romans' social turmoil and political conflict because both the Gospels and the rabbinic literature are formed in a particular political situation. And I would be the last to say that Greek did not impact the Gospels or Greek did not impact Jewish thought or the Hellenistic world did not in some way change and transform Judaism in different ways. But you know, it's kind of like some of the foreign terms we have in English. Uh, we have many foreign terms that we use in English. A lot of people don't even know what they meant in their source language. And after some of these concepts impact Judaism, they take on a new meaning within Jewish teachings. Well, when we get this historical background and the cultural experience, I think we're really ready to start looking at a religious orientation. If the Jewish view of history is really that of Torah, it begins with this understanding of both the written and the oral Torah. It's kind of interesting, a powerful statement that my teacher David Flusser made. He said, the Gospels provide sufficient evidence to the effect that Jesus did not oppose any prescription of the written or oral Mosaic laws. Now think about that. Here is an Orthodox Jew who is saying that there is nothing in either the written law or the oral law that Jesus opposed. Now I don't know what church background you came from, and you know, I really am grateful for the experience Experience I had in church growing up, but I just have to say that not everything I learned in Sunday school was right. How many of you would say that you learned good things in Sunday school, uh, but maybe not everything you learned? And I'm talking to Christians here today. Uh, one of the things that really was driven home to me was, well, Jesus didn't come to destroy the law and the prophets; He came to fulfill. So since He fulfilled them, they're all canceled, and so now we're under grace. How many of you know that's kind of like greasy grace, do whatever you want and slip on in, you know? Uh, that's, uh, uh, you know, I think we've got to get the teaching right. Sometimes I, I hear people just talk on and on about that. We're not under law. Don't put me under the law. We're under grace, you know. Don't talk about these things because Jesus canceled all that. He fulfilled all that. Well, you know, in Hebrew when you say fulfill, that means that you uphold it. You keep it. And I think if you really study Jesus of the Synoptic Gospels, he never canceled, he never disagreed. He would give an interpretation. Yesterday I used that term, the intensification of Torah. He would intensify the meaning of Torah by giving it an interpretation that would put it on a firmer footing. Even the Apostle Paul in Romans 3.31 asked the question, do you think we come to overthrow the law by preaching faith, he says, Meganoita, may it never be. Uh, no, by no means, no. I uphold the Torah by the proclamation of faith. Um, remember David Flusser, he always liked the New English Bible's translation there. We put the Torah on a firmer footing because it actually comes from that Greek word estemi, which means cause to stand, which is connected to the intensive form kiem in Hebrew from kum, which means rise to stand. You cause it to stand through a proper interpretation. What is the oral Torah? It is an intensification of Torah. It's interpreting it. It's applying it. What did Jesus say in Matthew chapter 23 and verse 1 and 2? The scribes and Pharisees sit on Moses' seat. Do what they say, but not what they do. You know, there's a big difference between criticizing the hypocritical practices of some members of a group and to deny the authenticity of their message. Here Jesus is saying, they're teaching right. Do what they're telling you. Well, this is an affirmation of the oral Torah. But 
Sometimes they don't always practice what they preach. How many of you know that that can be a problem in the church sometimes too? Um, you know, one thing I guess we should at least say for hypocrites, they know what to do even if they don't do it right. And maybe if we'd be real honest, uh, some, almost all of us, and I really include myself in it, some, almost all of us have a little bit of problem with that. Uh, but Jesus is saying their teachings are good. I don't think any of us want to be a, her, a hypocrite. None of us want to be a pretender. Maybe that would even be a better translation. That's how we're translating it in our Hebrew Heritage Bible. But, you know, we don't want to be a pretender. We want to be authentic. We want to be spiritual. We want to have a deeper walk. Well, uh, Jesus upheld these traditions, and he had this type of religious orientation. Uh, Jesus participated in Jewish festivals. He had a Passover with his disciples, and he took elements of the Passover as a feast of redemption and compared it with his own suffering. We see in family life, uh, in ancient Judaism, we learn a lot from the rabbinic literature about family life. And we learn a lot about how to study Torah and about prayer. And I think these are some things that we are not going to get outside of the rabbinic literature. I don't know, I think sometimes when I look at the Jewish prayer book or I look at the rabbinic literature, I think this is, this is kind of like somebody put something in a time capsule and they buried it. And when we dig it up, we have this treasure that we can learn so much. Well, one area that I spend a lot of time uh, looking at and is probably really uh, what we need to focus on a lot today is studying rabbinic parallels to the Gospels. And the first thing I should say is that just like a famous Jewish scholar, Samuel Sandmill, made an address when he was president of the Society of Biblical Literature on the danger of parallelomania is that there is really sometimes the tendency to take something that sounds similar to what Jesus said, maybe from later Jewish sources or sources that aren't relevant, and applying them to the Gospels. And I think that to really uh, do this in the way it should be done, you have to take extreme care and extreme caution. You have to think about when this saying or particular parallel uh, came from, who said it, when. You need to know the historical circumstances. And I feel like we need to embrace the study of rabbinic literature, but we need to do it with a scientific, critical method. I'm really concerned at the approach that most scholars take with this because they just say we can't study it because it's too late. Let me just show you some of the inconsistencies of that. Uh, anyone here that has been in a New Testament introduction course, uh, you know, one of the first things you study in New Testament introduction is the Papias tradition. You know, Papias lived 130 AD and he told us that Peter was the... Uh, Mark was the interpreter of Peter. How many of you have ever heard that from Papias? Papias told us that Matthew wrote the gospel in the Hebrew language. How many of you have heard that? We all talk about Papias, Papias. And we all date him to 130 AD. Well, how many of you have met that we don't have a shred, not even a page that Papias wrote? All we have are quotations of Papias and Eusebius, which was written in about 330 AD, 330 CE. And we can't study the Mishnah from 200, but we can study Eusebius and accept his quotation. How inconsistent is that? Uh, we can study the Nag Hammadi Codices, uh, and I want to study the Nag Hammadi Codices. I want to study Eusebius. Uh, here we've got documents uh, discovered at Hinboniskian in Egypt and Coptic. Uh, and they teach us a lot about Christianity in Egypt. I don't think they teach us that much about Jesus. But we have many scholars that are rushing to study that to learn about Jesus. John Dominic Crosin, he wants to study the Gospel of Peter. Oh, this is, you know, a great source. Uh, I already mentioned the Gospel of Thomas, the Gospel of Judas. Now we have the Da Vinci Code. Uh, all based on the Gospel of Philip. Probably, you know, problem with the lacuna. You know, you've got to make up the text as you go along. We've got millions of people going after that. But, you know, that's kind of outside the whole scholarly realm anyway. 
But I would say, you know, the real scholars are often inconsistent. Well, they will study church tradition, church fathers. They will exclude that evidence. Let's get the Jewish literature out of the ghetto. We need to take the rabbinic literature and study it with a sound scientific method. E.P. Sanders, who advocated this in his book, Judaism, Practice, and Belief, 63 BCE to 66 AD, uh, made this point. The rabbinic compilations, Mishnah, this is another term in Hebrew for this oral law we've been talking about, Tosefta, this is a collection of kind of additions that go with the Mishnah. Midrashim, those are Bible commentaries, uh, we can even find some things like that in the Dead Sea Scrolls and Talmuds, which is kind of a commentary on the Mishnah. He says, all are later than our period, that is the New Testament, being no earlier than the first part of the third century. And I don't know, there's probably some that we could date earlier. They certainly contain older material. And I think that's what we've got to really emphasize here, that the rabbinic literature contains a lot of older material. And you have to be kind of a textual archaeologist to be able to find some of that older material. Uh, E.P. Sanders notes, scholars of all schools accept attributions to a named Pharisee or rabbi as being fairly reliable. A rule attributed to Shammai probably reflects his view. Material attributed to a pre-70 Pharisee or to one of the earliest Post-70 rabbis constitutes a body of evidence that most scholars accept as representing Pharisaism. So here he's saying there's a way that we analyze the rabbinic literature to find what might be pertinent, what isn't pertinent. Um, I think that if we're going to know uh, the rabbinic literature, we have to be very careful in the way that we study it, but we should study it with historical critical method and include all of the evidence. James Charlesworth last night, I think, uh, praised Flusser for his balance. And one of the s- statements that he made that I think is very pertinent was that Flusser told us to study everything. There are a lot of New Testament scholars that say you should study everything except the rabbinic literature. Maybe one of the reasons, sometimes at least, that people don't want to study the rabbinic literature is that they really don't know Greek, they don't know Hebrew and Aramaic well enough. And really, um, you can study all of this literature through translations, but it is important to study them and to know the languages. E.P. Sanders noted, I am persuaded that many early traditions in rabbinic literature are overlooked when one focuses only on passages that are attributed to pre-70 Pharisees or to the early rabbis. And again, I think there are sometimes some parallels that come from what I would call a cultural background, a cultural setting that are very important to look at because even though they might come from a little bit of a later period. We have to see all of the parallels. Uh, Now I'm going to classify some of the parallels and talk about them briefly and then we're going to read some parallels to the teachings of Jesus. There are some parallels that maybe just give us a little bit of background information. What was a Passover meal like? If you want to date the Mishnah to 200 and say that that only represents what a Passover meal was like, well, hey, knowing what a Passover meal was like at 200 can help us know a little bit better of the temple times. The Mishnah describes the temple, describes the temple service. And really, to date the Mishnah 200 is a little misleading because we have all these earlier authorities. Probably one of the greatest leaders is Rabbi Meir, who lived about 160. And he, we have many quotations of references to Hillel, 20 B.C. E.P. Sanders says one way we're dating this, many Jewish scholars uh, would agree, is to see who said what. It's kind of like if I bought an encyclopedia and I read in it today, we have nothing to fear but fear itself. I'd say, well, do I date that 2006 when the book was printed? Or do I try to say, well, this was the American president in World War II uh, giving a speech. It would be crazy not to date it for the person that's quoting it. Well, you see, the Jewish people had a method of preserving history in an oral memory fashion. So a memorized text was the same as a written text. 
You couldn't change what you had memorized. And they carefully, meticulously developed these methods of oral. And many who have studied oral cultures notice this. And if you would start to misquote somebody, you would be corrected. You had to say it right. How many of you have ever read a favorite story to your children at night and they don't know how to read? But just try sometime to skip a word or skip a page and they will correct you. Why? Because they have that in their oral memory. Now most of us don't use our memory like that because we have a computer. If we forget it, we can Google it. We can look it up. Uh, we have libraries. But what about people that didn't have it so good? The way that they would remember these precious words was to memorize them. I love that text in Avot the Rabbi Natan that says, when you are sitting before your rabbi listening to him teach, you should sit with awe, trembling, looking as if you are hearing God speaking to Moses from Mount Sinai. Do you just change that, make up things, and add something that your rabbi didn't say? I mean, I'm not going to say that never happened, and in the scientific critical method, sometimes we doubt an attribution for one reason or another, but basically we would say that there was a desire to remember these things. Well, there's also similar text parallels. Sometimes we have things that are word for word, exactly what Jesus said. Um, if you get my book, The Parables, Jewish Tradition, Christian Interpretation, or my earlier book, Jesus and His Jewish Parables, um, I discuss one parallel there to the parable of the wise and foolish builders by Elisha ben Avuya. Very interesting, almost word for word the same. We have a lot of similar text parables. We also have a lot of linguistic parallels. I think uh, here, really, the Dead Sea Scrolls are also of great help. Incidentally, uh, if, the, if the rabbinic literature can't be used to study the New Testament, they shouldn't be used to study the Dead Sea Scrolls either. But you know, as soon as the Temple Scroll is published, everybody is waiting until Yaakov Zussman, the great uh, Jewish scholar, Talmudic scholar here at Hebrew University, who I had the privilege of studying with, uh, a few courses, uh, did an analysis of the halakha, the Jewish religious law in the temple scroll, and compare it with the halakha, Jewish religious law in the Talmudic literature. And they're always using the Talmudic literature to study the Dead Sea Scrolls, but again, using a scientific method. How dare Christians say, well, we don't want that. We don't want Jesus to be Jewish. We don't want him to speak Hebrew. We don't want to study the rabbinic literature. You see, as Samuel Sandmill, the same one who warned us against parallelomania, said, you've got to get a passport to study Jesus. And the passport is the rabbinic literature. So there's got to be a scholarly approach, but a careful scientific study of these parallels. Let me just give you a, a connection here with the uh, teachings of our Lord in the Beatitudes. Oh, what great blessing God shows to the poor who know their need for the Spirit because it is they who make up the kingdom of God. Think about parallel in Isaiah 66, 2, where it says, But to this one I will look, to him who is humble and contrite of spirit and who trembles at my word. How can we understand the Beatitudes if we don't look at some of the background here in the Hebrew text? Uh, look at Isaiah 57, uh, 15. I dwell on high and holy place and also with the contrite and lowly spirit. Mirom v'kadosh ashkonvet dak'e Ruach, the Shafal Ruach. Here we've got the Shafal Ruach that he's dwelling with. And there's even this text that he's going to raise them up, renewal, renew them. I love the parallel in Zephaniah 2 3. Seek the Lord, all you humble of the earth who have carried out his ordinances. Seek righteousness and humility. Here we have the Anve Aretz, very similar to the Anye uh, Ruach. 
And as has, uh, David Flusser pointed out early in his article about the Beatitudes, we find this same phrase, the poor in spirit in the Thanksgiving scroll. We also find the Henri Rook, the same phrase in the war scroll. I like uh, this uh, passage that has uh, come out in the Dead Sea Scrolls in the commentary on the book of Psalms. The Kovei Adonai, those who hope in the Lord, Hema Yeshu Aretz Pishro, Hema Adat Bachiro, Osei Retzono. The translation of this Dead Sea Scroll is, they that hope expectantly for the Lord, they are the ones who inherit the earth. Its interpretation refers to the community of its chosen ones. That is, those who do God's will. 4Q521, again one of these things I think helps us understand the language here. Upon the humble of his spirit, upon the humble, his spirit hovers. And for the faithful, they will be renewed by his strength. Al-anavim ruchol terechef ve'emunim yachalif Bakoho, this idea of Ruach from Genesis, Mirachefet al Paneamaim, hovering over the, it's hovering over the spirit. And if we would go to the uh, teachings of the rabbis, um, I think it's kind of interesting when we look at this last beatitude about persecution. In the Tosefta, uh, this collection that kind of interprets, explains the Mishnah, the oral law, part of the oral law that wasn't in incorporated into Rabbi Judah, the prince's work, they say, during a time of persecution, every person must give his or her life, even for the very least of the least commandments. So each person must work diligently for his sake. Uh, We find a lot of uh, very close parallels to uh, the Gospels when we start studying these different parallels and comparing them to Jesus' teachings. We find some that are Agadah, that would be parables, uh, legends, stories about the rabbis. We find some that are Halakha. Jesus deals with Halakha of the Sabbath. We find a lot in the rabbinic literature that deals with Halakha. We also find a lot that deals with Midrash. I always love the story in Agadah of Rabbi Eliezer who had studied with his rabbi all day he was riding home on his donkey and he met the exceedingly ugly man. He looked at that guy and says, you've got to be the ugliest guy I've ever seen. That's what he was thinking. Finally, he looked at him and he says, you know, you're the ugliest man I've ever seen. Is everybody in your town as ugly as you are? And the rabbi looked, uh, the exceedingly ugly man on the ground looked up on the rabbi on his donkey and he said, go to the master craftsman who made me and tell him how ugly is this vessel you've made. I think when I look at the Jewish Agadah, it's what really tells us the heart and the meaning of Scripture. And that's what we're seeing in these texts that we study in rabbinic literature, not just to make jurists or uh, intellectual scholars, but to make people who love God and seek Him. And this is what we find when we start looking at Jesus' teachings of discipleship and Torah as a life pursuit You can't just have Torah learning as a hobby. You can't just do that on Shabbat. Learning, discipleship, is a life pursuit. And no matter how much you study, you haven't studied enough. No no matter how much you've learned, you haven't learned enough. I don't know, I think sometimes we always make a big mistake when we tell people, well, you've got to study your Bible. You've got to study your Bible. Really what we should be telling them is, you've got to immerse yourself in the world of the Bible. You've got to immerse yourself in the Bible. Well, uh, when Jesus said, blessed are those who are mourned, listen to this text from the rabbinic literature. Great is the peace which is given to those who study Torah. As was said, all your children shall be taught by the Lord, and great shall be the peace of your children. Great is the peace which is given to the meek, as it was said. But the meek shall inherit the earth and delight themselves in the abundance of peace. Great is the peace which is given to those who work righteousness, as was said, and the work of righteousness will be peace. This is a very early commentary 
connected to the book of Numbers. And I think it's very close to what Jesus is teaching us. What about this saying from the rabbis? Again, from the same early commentary on Numbers. To what may Moses be compared to at that time? To a light which is set upon a lampstand, from which many lights are ignited. Nothing is lacking from this light in the same way that nothing is lacking from the light of Moses. And what did Jesus tell us? You are the salt of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a basket. Instead, they put it on a lampstand and it gives light to everyone in the house. Rabbi Simon ben Eliezer said, when the people of Israel do the will of their Father in heaven, then His name is magnified in the earth. Jesus our Lord said, in the same way, let your light so shine before people that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Oh, listen to this text from the Jerusalem Talmud. If the Torah is abolished in part, it is abolished completely. The Torah said, but Solomon has desired to abolish a yod. This is the smallest letter of the alphabet. From me, the Holy One, blessed be he, said, Behold, Solomon and a thousand like him will be abolished, but not one letter from you, the Torah, will ever be abolished. It's kind of interesting what this text is about, because if you remember, there's one commandment in Deuteronomy 16 that says the king should not multiply gold to himself, neither wives nor horses. That bothered Solomon. So he thought, I'll just take out one letter. And actually, if you start reading it, you can see, well, then it means multiply to yourselves gold, wives, horses. And the Torah is upset. He's counseled the letter. What did Jesus say? Do not think I have come to destroy the Torah and the prophets. I have not come to abolish, but to fulfill them. Think about this saying from the rabbis. If any person hates his or her neighbor and lies in wait for him and attacks him and wounds him mortally so that he dies. From this verse it was understood if a person transgressed a light commandment, he or she will finally be led to transgress a weighty commandment. If he transgresses the commandment, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, that one will finally be led to transgress the commandment you shall not take vengeance or bear any grudge. And then the commandment, you shall not hate your brother or your sister. And then the commandment, that your brother and sister may live beside you until that person will finally be led to commit murder. Therefore, if anyone hates his or her neighbor and lies in wait for him and attacks him. What? Did Rabbi Eliezer say something very similar? Here's another Jewish text like this. The one who hates his or her neighbor is considered a murderer. Because it was said, if anyone hates his or her, murder, his or her neighbor and rises up to attack him. What did Jesus say? You have heard that it was said to the people long ago, do not murder. And anyone who murders will be subject to the judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with his brother or sister will be subject to the judgment. If you transgress a light commandment like hatred, you may be in the end led to transgress a weighty commandment. Isn't it amazing how some of these parallels from the rabbinic literature are so intimately connected to the whole world, the historical background, the cultural uh, significance of Jesus' teachings. Think about this parallel. In regards to the commandment, do not commit adultery, it has been taught and explained, Rabbi Simon the son of Lachish, that anyone who commits adultery physically with his body shall be called an adulterer. But we say to you that anyone who commits adultery with his eye shall be called an adulterer. You have heard that it was said, Jesus taught, you shall not commit adultery. But I tell unto you, to you, anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has committed adultery with her already in his heart. Here's a real interesting text from the rabbis. Those who are insulted but do not insult hear themselves reviled without answering, act through love and rejoice in suffering. Of them the scripture teaches, but they who love him are as a son when he goes forth in his might. I like this parallel, Rabbi Chama ben Hanina, kind of a later uh, teacher. 
But he says, but even if your enemy rises early to kill you and comes to your house hungry and thirsty, you should give him food and drink. And think about how Jesus said, you have heard that it was said an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I tell you, do not resist one who is evil. If someone slaps you on your right cheek, turn to him the other as well. Now in our translation, we say instead of resist one who is evil, we say do not get into competition with evil. You don't fight evil with evil. You overcome evil by doing good. Uh, we could talk about the disciples' prayer. We could talk about the theme of forgiveness in the same way that Jesus taught us to pray, Lord, forgive me like I forgive everybody else. We have the teaching of Abba Shaul. Oh, be like God. In the same way that he is gracious and merciful to forgive, so you must also be merciful and forgive. What about storing up treasures in heaven? There's a very famous uh, king who converted to Jewish faith and practice. Monobaz, the king of Ariabini, rose up and dispersed all his accumulated assets to the poor during the time of famine, about 46 CE. His relatives sent a message to him, Your ancestors stored up treasures and increased the wealth of their ancestors, but you have free, freely given away your treasures and those of your ancestors. He answered by saying, My ancestors accumulated wealth for the world beyond, below, but I have stored up treasures for the world above. Very similar to what our Lord said, Do not store up treasures for yourself on earth, where moth, rust, consume, where thieves break in and steal. Think about what Rabbi Simon ben Eliezer taught when he said, Have you ever seen a wild animal or a bird practicing a profession? Yet they have their sustenance provided for without anxiety. How much more then should I have my sustenance provided for without anxiety? Rabbi Eliezer the Great said, Whoever has a piece of bread in his basket today and says, What will I eat tomorrow? Behold, he is of little faith. Here I think we have the same phrase, Katanei Muna, just as Jesus taught us in the Sermon on the Mount. Do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not the life more important than food and the body more important than clothes? Your heavenly Father knows what you need before you even ask. Do not worry about tomorrow's trouble, the rabbi said. You do not know what a new day will bring forth. After all, tomorrow may come and you will be no more. Then you will suffer trouble over a world that is not your own. What did Jesus teach? Do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will have enough worry in its own time. What about judging others? You know, Hillel the elder said, Do not judge your neighbor until you come to his or her place. Uh, Jesus also said, Judge not that you would not be judged. Here's one of these parallels I think is so interesting where Rabbi Tarfon said, I wonder if there's anyone in this generation who can accept correction. For if someone says, Take the splinter out of your eye, Someone else will say, well, take the log out of your own eye. Remember how our Lord said, why do you see the splinter in, that's in your friend's eye, but you do not know the log that is in your own eye? Uh, what about the teaching of the golden rule? Hillel said, what you do not want someone to do to you, do not do to them. This sums up the Torah, and the rest is commentary. And what did Jesus teach? You shall love your neighbor as yourself. He said, uh, this is, sums up the Torah and the prophets. I would argue that if we're going to really understand the New Testament, we must explore the Jewish roots in the Talmud. And I think in each one of these parallels, we have to think about what source it appears in. We need to think and understand who said it. We need to under analyze the language, the culture, the background. But I think even sometimes some of the later rabbinic literature can give us insight into the culture, the history, the teachings of Jesus. I have even heard Jewish scholars uh, say that the New Testament is a great source that helps us understand the Talmudic literature. And I think one of the great uh, advances that has been made here in Jerusalem is that we've had 
Jewish scholars, Christian scholars studying this together. I don't know, maybe the reason we have the negative form of the golden rule with Hillel, do not do to others what you do not want them to do to you, because that's the form of the Ten Commandments. Do not murder. Well, you know, that's doing unto others. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Um, I remember uh, when I had the privilege of teaching a course at Hebrew University that was a comparison between Judaism and Christianity. And uh, we were studying this passage of Hillel's statements, comparing it with the Gospels. And I was kind of trying to show these close similarities between Jesus and these Jewish sources. I had an Orthodox Jewish woman there in the class. It's kind of interesting. She says, no, you know, Jesus is a lot different here. I said, well, well, what do you mean? Or don't they just kind of say the same thing? She says, well, don't you see, it's one thing not to do something to somebody. You know, you want somebody to steal from you, so don't steal. But, you know, it's another thing when you look and you think about what are the needs of that other person, and then you try to do something about it. I mean, if you were hungry, you'd want somebody to feed you, wouldn't you? If you didn't have clothes, you want somebody to help you. And really, I think that's one of the aspects of Jesus' teachings that he is always emphasizing, really, in the stream of the Hasidim from first century Israel, is that you have to raise your level of righteousness to a higher level, another dimension. Uh, we've talked a lot about discipleship. One of my favorite stories that comes from this uh, background is a story of the rabbi who's walking with his disciples and he asks them, well, do you love me? And they say, well, you're a rabbi. Of course we love you. You know how much we love you. He says, well, tell me where I hurt. He says, well, we don't know where you hurt. How can you say you love me if you don't know where I hurt? Uh, I really think that as Christians, we need to study the rabbinic literature to fully understand and appreciate the spiritual heritage that we have. Uh, we share so much in common. And yet, of course, there are uh, distinctions, there's differences, and sometimes those differences are very important. But we need to understand, as the Apostle Paul said, there is a tree that nourishes the root. Some of us have cut off the branch we're sitting on. It's not very healthy. Uh, we need to look at this. And as a New Testament scholar, I want to say it is uh, very uh, crucial today that we study everything that we can know about Jesus whether it's archaeology, whether it's Josephus, whether it's Philo, the Dead Sea Scrolls have helped us a lot. I want to study the Nag Hammadi Codices. I want to know everything I can about the Stoic philosophy, cynics, the Greco-Roman environment. All of these things can add to helping us get a full picture. But if we have rejected studying the rabbis, I think we're going to miss Jesus and the major source that gives us insight into the way that he taught, the way that he shared his message concerning uh, the kingdom of God. Let me close by just making this statement. Jesus brought Judaism into the world. <laughs> Ever thought about that? Uh, many of us are here as from a Christian background to study about this because of Jesus. Really, the content of the Sermon on the Mount is intimately connected to the concepts of the old Judaism practiced by the Jewish people during the days of the Second Temple period. Jesus instructs his followers to make disciples, to teach commandments. His interpretation of the Torah and the commandments shows his followers how to live a life a life of purposeful obedience through a deeply spiritual walk and inner life. How ironic it is, then, that the world has invented its own brand of Christianity. Some Christians want Christianity to be distinctly different from any vestige of the old Judaism. Their brand of faith and belief often is devoid of commandments and good works. 
They build a wall of separation between the Christianity that Jesus revealed and the Sermon on the Mount and the Judaism lived by the Jewish people in daily life. They neglect the fact that Jesus was a Jew. Contrary to popular opinion, Jesus never converted to Christianity. He provided an example to all by living the Jewish faith in daily life. He reverenced the Torah and its commandments. The faith in Jesus proclaimed by Christianity should never undermine the need to observe the teachings of Jesus. Thank you very much.